parks, schools, restaurants, and more, Assembly Row gets high scores. We're a thriving city with so much to do. Uncle Boston Harbor in our view. Politics, cannabis, controversial stories, heroes, and villains. Who gets the glory? 50 plus languages in Somerville are spoken. Sanctuary City, there are no three tokens. History in Somerville stays alive. In all American cities, we won three times. Somerville connects. Somerville connects. Welcome to another edition of Dead Air Live, the longest live-running TV show in America and audio podcast, Somerville Connects. Today, I am so thrilled to have Carlos Martinez, who is the opera man. Welcome, Carlos. <laughs> Jojo, thank you very much for having me. I love, I love the laugh before you began. It's fabulous. <laughs> so, Carlos... Who are yes. you? Who are I just met you for the first time. You came to my house. You delivered yes. some audio tracks. And yes. I want you to take us on a little journey. Who is Carlos Martinez? Do take us from wherever part of your life you want to begin. Great. Well, uh, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, so I'm a Southern boy. And um, I uh, started studying voice Seriously, when I, was in, when I was a junior in high school, I had a teacher who happened to be a, uh, an accompanist uh, at an Italian opera company, and she was on sabbatical and wanted to teach at a public school. So I was very lucky to have her, and she noticed that I had this deep bass voice I've had since about uh, seventh grade or so. So she was the one who really started to get me on my journey. And so after high school, I went to college and I studied voice. I did my master's work uh, at the University of uh, Houston. And then from there, I went to go sing in many parts of the world. And I ended up in New England because I met my lovely, my lovely wife, my ex-wife now, but my lovely wife, her name is Jane Cormier. She was quite famous and known in the Andover, Mass area. And she convinced me to move up to New England about 28 years ago. And it brought me here and to this to the state of New Hampshire, and I'm in Manchester, New Hampshire right now. So that's sort of in a, in a nutshell. But in between that time, I traveled all over the world, singing in many, many languages. I am a conductor as well, and I'm also an accompanist. I am a church organist, and I also teach voice. Wow, that is fabulous. So these languages that you speak, I believe you yes. speak nine languages? Well, when you sing opera, what you do is you have to study the language. You don't necessarily have to speak the language, but you have to study the pronunciation, the inflection, uh, and study with coaches uh, and uh, linguists uh, to be able to get you to where you need to be so that way when you sing, you sound as if you know the language. I speak German fluently. I speak Spanish fluently, of course, English. Uh, if you speak Italian to me, I can get around. It's no problem. And French as well, too. I can read French quite well. But I have sung in Hebrew, in Portuguese, Russian, um, French, Italian, German, Spanish, and uh, one point, yes, also Mandarin Chinese. It was a piece that I had to do in Mandarin Chinese as well. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> yes. You know, I, I often wonder when I hear opera, because my grandfather was a lover of opera, and he was the first person... To have, I guess they called them phonographs back in the day in the north end of Boston. Yes. And people in the north end of Boston would hear the opera coming from his home and they would just like wander outside and just stand by and listen because opera is so beautiful, so emotional. So, so passionate, yes. Oh my goodness, it's it's so much drama. Maybe that's why I have so much drama because... My family has a lot of drama, probably because of the opera. But, but, but here's my question. Is it easier to sing opera in one language over another? Well, the history of opera really goes all the way back uh, to, to, to Greece with the Greek plays. But the, the root of opera is in Italy. 
And yes. It ha- yes. <laughs> so, so it happens to be that when you sing or speak in Italian, there, uh, you, you have these things called pure vowels and you have the ah, the e, e, o, u. And so they're nice and open and clear and clean. And opera singers spend many years trying to perfect that to try and keep a nice open space. But in Italian, especially in Italian, it is so much easier to do it because it's very clear, very basic. There are no, there, there is no doubt as to what the, what the actual phoneme or, or, or sound is. So, uh, Italian definitely is a much easier language to sing in. English is one of the worst. And the reason why is because there's so many diphthongs, spelled D-I-P-H-T-H-O-N-G. So we, a diphthong is basically a lot of chewing of the vowels. So for instance, we as Americans, when we say the word no, has two different sounds. You have no, and then o, oh, the, the chewing. So you have no. However, if you are to do that in Spanish, you don't have the chewy part. You just have no. You don't have no. So English is really, really hard to sing it. So Italian, absolutely, it's a wonderful language to sing it. And I think it's the easiest to me to sing it. When I hear people speak in Italian, it sounds very melodic, which is why, because it's very clear. Yes. But but Italians do, for some reason, when they say, oh, you look nice, they say, you look nice, sir. They, uh, the, yeah. Why do they add? Why do they add the a at the end? Everything well, always has a vowel at the end. There is, and we call that in in uh, in diction. We call that a schwa. A schwa is an upside down e, and so there's an uh. So when they say you look a nice, uh, you look a nice, uh, it's because it's idiomatic in the language. The language has a lot of of the of unaccented schwas at the end of it. Um, so by nature, if you speak Italian and you try to speak a different language, you add part of that language, you know, part of that into, uh, into the English words. So for instance, um, if you were to speak Spanish and have, have grown up speaking Spanish all your life, they will say, ese, they, they have an eh before the word happens. Es, I was a singing the other day. I was a singing, a singing. Because in their language, in Spanish language, you don't have I was singing. You have to add an eh before it. You see that? So in Spanish, it's in the front and in Italian, it's in the back. So hey. Is, yeah. is, isn't that funny? Okay. I, funny. Want, I want to share a funny story. It's about my grandmother. She came to America and she's learning English. So the teacher says, uh, does anybody know this word? And the word is because, B-E-C-A-U-S-E. Yes. And my grandmother raises her hand, teacher, teacher, I know, I know. Her. And she says, <laughs> I, know. I know, I know. Her. It's because. Of. <laughs> now, now, because of in Italian is, is the bathroom. And, 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 and because comes from the slang back house, because when people went to the bathroom, they would say back house. Yeah. And so it's almost I, like, wow. yeah, I know. Just giving you the whole translation there. Interesting. You know, it, it, what's funny is, is that um, you've, you've heard of the word gringo, right? Yes. Isn't that a man like, for, for, for Mexican? Yeah. Uh, uh, a gringo is actually a gringo is a white man. If you are Spanish and you say gringo, oh, that's a gringo. It's because uh, he is considered white and not Mexican, right? Well, that word, funny enough, came from the color of the uh, of the uniform that the that the American Army wore, and they called them green coats, green coats, green coats. Oh, and wow. And so that's where the name comes from. So they go, gringo, gringo. It comes from gringo, gringo. Oh, that's that's like the Bacausa. Absolutely, absolutely. So it, it, isn't it fascinating how, you know, sort of the history of words and how they, um, how they begin? I love words. I love words and I love numbers. So I'm, oh, really? I'm fascinated. Yes. I do, do you have I a, do. Do you, do you have a favorite number? I do. What is that? Two, two, two. And why is that? It is a spiritual number. It has a oh. vibration. 
Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. I thought it meant because you're a you're a ballet dancer, you know, tutu. Oh, <laughs> oh, I I am not a ballet dancer. Oh my goodness, that's a funny thought. No, I am I am not. You, to be a ballet dancer, you have to be very flexible. I mean, they do things that are just yeah. I, I'm not flexible, not like that. But so, do you enjoy singing or teaching? Because you're a vocal coach. I am. Yes. Well, for the first part of my career. I did a lot of singing. I, like I said, I traveled all over the world. And when you're on tour and you're singing, every hotel looks the same, even though you're going to the most beautiful places and singing on the most beautiful stages in the world. It, you, know, you want to have a home. You want a place to be able to, you know, to be able to settle down and call home. And so uh, I met my ex-wife, Jane Cormier, on a stage, as a matter of fact, um, we were, she was, uh, Carlotta in Phantom of the Opera in, in the Vienna production. Wow. And I, and I was singing in Northern Germany and we were both hired to sing for Des Moines Metro Opera. And there, uh, they have an opera company there that does a tour, a six month tour where they bring in younger upcoming opera singers to tour for six months and do about 500 performances all over the state of Iowa. And that's where we met. And one of the first offers we did, I was the villain. She was the heroine. Things never changed. Uh, <laughs> so why did you fall in love with your wife? Well, because she, she dropped dead gorgeous. Not only talented, but very, very good looking. And what a mind on her. Absolutely brilliant mind. And as a matter of fact, when um, we, you know, we fell in love and we... We got married rather quickly because we just, we just, you know, we just, we just love each other so, so much. Um, she convinced me to move up to New England. Like I said, she was from Andover, Massachusetts. And so we, because of her, we began our own opera companies. She, be, she ended up being a stage director and I ended up being a conductor. And we're both voice teachers as well. And so to answer your, you know, you know, I am answering your question sort of in a long way, but um, I really, I, I enjoyed the singing when I did it. It got old because I got to travel all over, but I wanted a place to call home. Then I got to, to conduct uh, and direct opera and teach lessons. And I so enjoy doing that now, but I've got the itch again to do it again, to go oh, back out there. Really? Can, oh, absolutely. You, can you break out into a, a verse? Can you sing something for us? Sure. Uh, you know, I can go, Come se frice ca, la luna chiena, lo mare ride, l'aria è serena, voi è che facite, e la gomia, Santa Lucia, Santa Lucia. Wow, that was beautiful. You know, my my singing and acting coach used to tell me that, you know, when someone's singing right, when their tongue is laying flat in their mouth. Uh, yes. And, and your, is... tongue, your tongue was, wasn't flopping around. It was laying uh, flat. Uh, 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 uh. Well, you know what? That particular piece, uh, I think I messed up one of the lines. It is actually a, um, it is a Neapolitan uh, song, and it is actually very old Italian. A lot of Italians don't even understand the language uh, from the Santa Lucia. So it's a very, it's a very ancient uh, uh, piece, and I think one of the lines I messed up, but that's okay. You got the point. Yes. Okay. So when people have an accent, like the Beatles, they're, they're English, and they sing... Yes. They don't have an accent. Why is that? You know what? Great question, because a lot of times it's, be, it's hard to be able to tell when the accent is there or not. But you know what? Great, great question. I think because sometimes, for instance, if you're, if you're British, um, if you say the word all, all, you've got to go all instead of all. It's all. And if you were to sing it, the mouth is more closed. And what we as people hear when we hear a singer and we say, oh, that's a great singer, is we hear open, pure vowels, very clear, open vowels. So if they were to go, oh, rather than, oh, oh it's much more open. See that? And right. so so I, I think that's what they're doing is they're 
uh, what, what we call it in singing is called to modify the vowel. So we change it so that, so that way it becomes clear. And you know what? Really, you, they are really singing to an international audience. And so, so you want to make it as absolutely clean and clear as possible. I never thought about that. So it's the way you, you actually hold your mouth that you, that, that determines the sound that comes out of you. But not only that, it also determines the style. For instance, if I were to sing uh, a country western song, uh, and you know, and, and, and say the word "say" in opera, it'd be "say," right? "Say," "say." But in country western, "say," "say," they go right to the E sound and they close up the mouth. So country western is a lot of closing, twangy, nasally kind of sounds. But typically, what you do is you want to have an open sound when you sing, because we're really singing vowels, and that's what people are listening to, are the vowels that we are singing. So you want to clear it up. So if somebody came to you and they said, you know, I've always wanted to sing, and let's say they're in their 40s or 50s, could you teach them to sing? Is it possible if someone is an older person? I I have a firm belief. Now, there are many voice teachers that, that say you either got it or you don't. I'm a firm believer that anyone can sing. You know, when some people say, oh, I can't carry a tune in the bucket, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a great singer. Here's what I, here's what I tell them. I, I tell them, you are singing, you're just not singing in the same key that we are in at the moment. Okay? Just, you know, so you have to teach these people, if they cannot sing well, you have to teach them how to be able to feel what a note is. Not just listen, but literally feel what the note is so they can understand how they're making that sound. And a lot of people don't want to take the time to do that. See, I, in my studio, um, uh, I, I take the time to teach people how to sing. Now, those that can sing and have sung, it's easier, of course. But yes, I'm a firm believer that you can teach anyone to sing. You have to first identify where they are. Can they match pitch? Can they read music? And, and that's fine if they can. Did you know that Luciano Pavarotti used to have everything taught to him by rote? meaning that he did not read music. Oh, really? The, one of the greatest tenors in our, in our generation, in our history, whom I absolutely love and adore, um, did not read music. So he was taught by his coach verbatim, you know, by rote, all the notes. So, so, it's, so it's not necessary to be able to read the music, but at least to be able to hear how the pitches go so that way you can start to figure out, you know, if it's higher, Try to hit it in the center, it's lower. So yes, you can teach people how to sing, even though they feel they may not be able to. Someone like yourself, who's a seasoned opera man, do you still have to continue taking voice lessons? Um, up to a certain point, yes. I think when you're older and you've done it a lot and you're a voice teacher, I think it's good every now and then to get a checkup. Uh, as a matter of fact, my high school choir director, now I am turning 58 tomorrow. All right. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Uh, my my ex choir director, her name is Dottie Randall. Now, for those of you that uh, are are listening and have and are in the opera circles, you have heard the name Dottie Randall before. And she is an accompanist coach who travels all over the world to play. She is still alive and living in San Antonio. And every once in a while when I go back there, I say, Hey Dottie, I need to check up on the voice. You, I need I need you to tell me where I am and where I need to be. And so she she has me sing for, for two and a half hours straight. And then she says, okay, now we're going to start to sing. <laughs> so, so she really works me. And so I think every once in a while, yes, it's good to have a checkup. You don't necessarily need lessons, you know, all the way through until you're older, but definitely for a foundational, um, you know, for foundation, absolutely. You need to be able to have a teacher to be able to help and guide, you know, to help guide you. Even me, as I'm older, I, it takes me a long time now to warm up. It used to not take me so much time to do that. Uh, and I, it still takes time to be able to get to where I need to be. Do you find it easier singing when the environment is humid? Because I know I do. I really love. It's easier for me to belt out a song when it's humid out. Is that the case with you? Jojo, that's a great question. And, and uh, you know, since we are, uh, what is it, 80% water, I'm not sure, sure the percentage, it's pretty, it's pretty high. 
Um, whatever happens with the uh, the pressure, uh, not the air pressure, but the the barometric humidity, pressure. Yeah, yeah, the humidity and all that has an effect on our voices. As a matter of fact, many many singers, when it is wet and rainy and thick, you know, you know clouds and it's dark and gray, many singers tend to sing flat. They sing under pitch. If this if this were the note, they're about here when they sing because it has an effect. When it's a clear day, singers sing usually at their best. Now, for you, you might like the extra humidity to help, you know, uh, you know, on the chords that would maybe help you sing better. And maybe you're comfortable in that, you know, sort of in that atmospheric uh, environment. Well, you know, when I uh, when uh, when I moved into my apartment, I asked the uh, I asked the contractor to put in steam heat because. He says, why would you want steam heat? I says, because if I want to sing, it's just easier on my vocal cords. Yes, yes. Many, many teachers actually run, uh, uh, they boil water because it is actually, it, it, um, it doesn't dry you out. Most singers nowadays um, have allergies and all this stuff. And so what they do is they take medicine like Sudafed and all these deep, deep decongestants, right? Antihistamines, right? And the job of the antihistamine is to dry you out so that you're not dripping. And so that's a problem. So you have to hydrate and having moist air definitely helps. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, when a person gets older, and I'll use Tony Bennett as an example, the voice is really the last thing to, to go. Your voice basically <laughs> stays with you for a long time. I mean, it's sure pretty, pretty much the same. Why is it that the body gets older, but the voice does not get as old as the body? You know, that's a, you know, you ask such probing questions. You're very good at this. Okay. Thank um, you. <laughs> um, uh, so that's a great question. And I, I, I really never thought about that before, but mind you, the vocal cords, see, uh, in your throat, you have your larynx, and inside, uh, sort of your Adam's apple, you have the vocal cords. And they're really not called cords; they're actually called vocal folds. And these two big pieces, like a, two big pieces of meat, that are that are that are hitting each other. Uh, the original, the original use of the cord in prehistoric times was actually to be able to 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 close the glottis. The glottis is the space between the vocal cords. Okay, whenever you lift something heavy. The first thing we do is take a breath and go. <gasps> That's right. Correct. Yeah. And the reason yes. why we do that is because we need to create pressure between the diaphragm and the uh, the the glottal opening here, the the, the uh, closed glottis, to for, to make us stronger. It's like having a like a like like a, you know, a like a belt. So imagine how how strong those cords are. You could literally run mat trucks, these big eighteen wheeler trucks, over the cords. And the cords are going to be fine. They, they sustain a lot, a lot of pressure. I mean, look at this, all the vibration that's going on for singers especially. So I think it's because they're durable and because they're constantly moving, they're being exercised. So we don't lose that. See, it's, it's the stuff that we, you know, as we get, as we age, things tend to get hard and dry out because we don't use things as much. You know, we don't, you know, we don't stretch as much as we should. And um, so, but the cords are always being used. So, oh, so, so, so they're strong because it's a muscle that's always being used. Always being used. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yes. So tell me about you playing in a church. Why a church? I mean, churches are great. The acoustics are fabulous in church. They are. They are. Well, I have a very strong faith and I, and, um, I enjoy the environment, but um, I I am truly. But first, I am a um, voice teacher singer. Uh, I am definitely a great conductor, a, a very good conductor. I shouldn't say great, but I'm a very good conductor. All of my instrumentalists here in New Hampshire say, "Yes, you're very good." I conduct ensembles and groups here, and um, a lot of them say that I'm very good. So I think, I, you know, so I, I think that's the case. I am at uh, I am at best. Uh, uh, I call myself a functional keyboardist, okay? So what it does is playing at a church forces me to be able to practice my hymns, 
you know, practice pre preludes and postludes and learn to be a better keyboardist. So, uh, aside from the environment of being there, being able to have a choir, uh, that I, that I work with, um, and to play such glorious music, mind you, most, you know, over half of the, of the, of the music that has been ever, that has, has ever been written is on the religious side. So we have a lot of music, you know, to, to be able to cover. So this is why I enjoy playing in the church as well. So, uh, so that's why I do that. How can people find you if they want to study with you? Well, um, they can Zoom me. I, I, do, I don't like the Zoom thing because it's so hard to hear nuance. It's hard to hear timbre. But if, if they like to hear me, all they have to do is just type in Carlos Martinez Vocal Studio dot com or just Carlos Martinez New Hampshire. And I'm usually first on the list. I've been doing this here in New Hampshire for about uh, 25 years. And I have a great clientele. I have some people that come in from uh, Boston as well. And um, so you can just, just type in Carlos Martinez Vocal Studio and you'll be able to find my information on there. Uh, and uh, we get you going on some lessons. Beautiful. Carlos, you have been so delightful today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Carlo Martinez, opera man. He's in New Hampshire, Massachusetts. <laughs> New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Uh, I was going to say New Hampshire, Massachusetts. No, New <laughs> Hampshire. Is in it, in yes. the United States of America. Yes, I'm in, in, Man in, 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 in Manchester. 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 Yes, in Manchester. Manchester. Yes. Thank you, yes. Carlos. And thank well, you. Thank folks. you for having me, Jojo. Thank you. And thank you, folks, for listening to another edition of Dead Air Live and Somerville Connects. Bye for now. Bye. Somerville Connects. Somerville Connects.